this point, please join me in welcoming Dr. Pasta. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Mary, and it's wonderful to be back here in Stillwater. And I've been looking forward to this trip ever since Mary uh, called and invited me a number of months ago to be part of this. And it is really exciting to know that the uh, exhibit is now traveling. And I'm just really sorry that I can't participate in some of the other events that you have organized. So they sound really great. So I wanted to give you a little bit for my place for my water bottle. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about this project. So um, as Mary said, this originally started out as um, a project that now has the name of the National Traveling Exhibit, Dust Drought and Dreams Gone Dry. And our goal was to document the stories of women in uh, a number of counties in Oklahoma, those we felt like were particularly hard hit by the Dust Bowl. And one of the reasons that we were interested in doing that is the Oklahoma Historical Society has a large collection of interviews that they conducted in the 40s and 50s uh, with people that lived through the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma. But uh, very few of these are with women and they didn't tend to deal with issues that had they been with women might have come up in the course of the conversation. So, um, and I'll talk about what some of those are. But as uh, Mary mentioned, Stephen Kite and Shelley Lemons, who were graduate, they were doctoral students in history at the time that we undertook this project in 2001 and 2002. And they both uh, finished their PhDs and Steve teaches at the University of Arkansas at Fort Smith, and Shelley teaches at McKendree College, which is in the suburbs of St. Louis. And so it was a really fabulous uh, learning experience for the three of us working together because I had never done oral histories. Uh, Steve and Shelley both had done oral histories before, and so although I was the principal investigator for this project as a faculty, member, I felt like in many respects um, I was led by them because they had actual, you know, boots on the ground kind of experience doing this. So the other two people that are really important um, that I wanted to mention in this project is that when we began to collect these oral histories, we had done quite a bit of um, investigating to find out how major oral history programs in the United States were collecting oral histories and specifically what technology they were using. And so one of the things that was, you know, in 2000, when we started planning this in 2000, people were talking a little bit about digital, but nobody really had very much experience using it. And so we decided we're just going to collect these on audio cassettes that, you know, we know how audio cassettes work. We understand them. We have some idea of how to preserve them. Um, but several years after the fact, we thought, hmm, we should have maybe, you know, we shouldn't have followed the lead of these other programs and we should have ventured into the digital realm. And so we had this great project and we felt like many oral history projects, it was just going to remain uh, buried uh, in some archival boxes and special collections. And so Juliana Nicolasian in our Oklahoma Oral History Research Project and Latasha Wilson did an incredible amount of work to bring the bulk of this material um, to the web. And so um, you know, without that effort, I think that very few people would have utilized uh, this collection. So I, I really can't uh, overstate their role in this. So the way that we decided that this might be an interesting area to focus a research project on, and an oral history research project in particular, is I, when I moved to Stillwater, my next door neighbor was this wonderful woman named Enid Pritchard. And, her, and Enid and Guy had lived in Stillwater for a very long time, but as you can see from the dates, 
associated with her. She lived to the ripe old age of 97. She was born right before statehood and she grew up in Enid and so when she got married in the early 1930s, the, you know, there was not only the Great Depression going on but also the Dust Bowl and I hadn't heard very much about the Dust Bowl being a Marylander. And so her stories that she shared with me of what it was like as a new bride to, you know, basically have nothing and to be living in, they were living out in Western Oklahoma and just how bleak and desolate uh, that was. And I thought, wow, this is incredible. Like I should go over with a tape recorder and record this story. Um, but so when I came to be the head of special collections and I was talking to Steve Kite and found out that he had um, worked for the Kansas Historical Society and had conducted a number of oral history projects for them, it just seemed like, oh, well maybe there's something that we could do to collect these stories. And so that was really the inspiration uh, behind the project. Project and then I, as I said before, when we started to do research, we discovered that the stories of women hadn't really been very well documented. So, as I also mentioned, I didn't know a whole lot about the Dust Bowl, and uh, not having grown up here, and it, you know, I'm sure it was mentioned in uh, some U.S. history course that I took in high school, and I'm sure, like most high school students, I didn't pay attention because I didn't think it sounded very interesting. And so, um, we decided that, you know, a lot of people that lived in Oklahoma have memories of the Dust Bowl period, but we really wanted to focus on the counties where the Dust Bowl was considered to have had the greatest impact. And so the seven counties that we kept coming across as we looked at various maps of the Dust Bowl were the seven that are identified here, so the Oklahoma Panhandle and then that area right underneath the Panhandle and going uh, inward a little bit. But um, this was where we decided to concentrate our interviewing and to look for interview participants. Okay, so as Mary mentioned, we interviewed almost 150 women. There were a few men thrown in there. Um, we, one of the things that we started out thinking is that we were gonna interview women individually. And um, the first couple of interviews we did uh, didn't go very well. And one of the reasons that they seemed to not go very well is that women, when they were you know, interviewed as individuals, seemed to think that they had nothing interesting to say. But then when they were in a group with other women, um, they were feeding off of each other. And so one would tell a story and then it would remind another one of you know, something that had happened to them. And so we decided after experimenting in our pilot phase um, that we were gonna interview women in groups. And so um, all told, because we did have some interviews that took place in Stillwater, and in a few other places that were outside of our target area. There were um, interviews conducted in 10 counties. We did this over 15 months. Um, and there were all these other people that I've already mentioned that were involved in this project. And we weren't sure how many people we would interview. We just wanted to try to get, um, you know, at least some from each of the seven counties that we had identified and we decided once we started hearing a lot of the same stories again and again, we would consider that we had reached our saturation point and that um, that would probably be a good uh, end to the interview project. Now since, I've got to stop resting my hand there. Uh, since we closed the project, I've done many presentations um, on the project and I always have people afterwards that want us to interview them and so that would be great but we haven't been actively collecting more interviews. Um, another important thing that I um, failed to mention is that one of the reasons that we decided it wasn't just 
the lack of a women's perspective, and it wasn't just, you know, I thought my next door neighbor had a great story to tell, and we should record it. But we realized, looking at the age range of women who would likely be the best informants for this project, so we wanted people that were old enough that their memories of this time were actually their memories, and they weren't repeating stories that had been passed down in their family. So we felt like it was important that they were probably at least in their early teens. And we actually interviewed a woman out in uh, Hooker who was 105 years old. So she had been in her 40s living through the, early 40s living through the Dust Bowl period. Um, so we decided that given the age of these women that we, um, if we wanted to do this project, we needed to do it because in all likelihood, if we waited longer, the women wouldn't be um, available to be interviewed. And as I was looking back at the people that, have, that participated in this, um, I don't think we've done updated this list in a couple of years, but for a while we were, um, this sounds a little morbid, but we were, you know, continuing to track them to see are these women still living so we know that an awful lot of the women that we interviewed are no longer living. So some of the uh, themes that we decided that we wanted to uh, cover in our interviews were, of course, the family and formative years. And uh, we were really interested in how this time period affected domestic Life. We heard a lot of men say that it was the women who held the family together, but they never really elaborated. So we wanted to see, well, what did this holding uh, together look like? Um, we were also interested in why they stayed. And I, I should point out that, you know, this, we did this a number of years before Timothy Egan's um, National Book Award winning novel, The Worst Hard Time, was published. Um, it was a, a good 10 years before um, Ken Burns did his documentary. And so it was a little bit more intriguing to us maybe than it might be now with all of the information that's come out about, you know, why they stayed. To me, it seemed like a really bad idea. Like if you had any choice whatsoever, you would have gotten the heck out of Dodge. Well, that was the whole issue is that people you know, really didn't have choices, and they had this um, connection with the land. Uh, we were also interested in um, what the, some of the WPA and New Deal efforts look like and how they might have impacted women specifically. And then what about going through this experience uh, made, them, made a lasting impact on them? So, as I told you before, these are the seven counties. If you couldn't visualize what I was doing with my hands, now you have a visual for exactly where these are. And uh, this is a map that shows sort of the epicenter of the Dust Bowl. And um, the exact center of the Dust Bowl was considered to be Cimarron County. Uh, Oklahoma, so if we go back to this map, it's the very last uh, county in the panhandle. So one of the things that was interesting to us is um, what this area was like before um, the Dust Bowl period. And um, it was interesting because there wasn't a tremendous amount that would really capture what this area, the seven counties, uh, look like before then, but we know that they were very, um, at, from time to time, that they were rich um, grasslands and that there had been a lot of buffalo uh, in that area. And that um, at the time that settlement started opening up, and this has happened in other places, not only in this country, but I was just, I'm listening to a an audio book about Australia, and it was talking about how when explorers came to Australia, to the eastern coast of Australia, that they happened to be there during a time that was um, very wet, like far more than normal, and these explorers thought, oh, this must be the dry season, because it was so different than Europe, 
And so they settled there thinking that there would be extensive opportunities for agriculture. And so it was not only abnormally wet when they were there, but they you know, had totally gotten it wrong. That wasn't the wet season, it was the dry season. And I, as I was listening to that, I thought, yeah, this sounds a lot like um, the reaction that people had when they came to this um, part of the country that, oh, the, you know, this is, it's wet, it's always like this, we can count um, not on the 12 to 14 inches of rainfall that are typical for that part of the state, but on a much greater amount of rainfall. So there were um, all these events that sort of conspired to create um, a, a perfect storm, and Timothy Egan in his book weaves these elements uh, together so well. And uh, he talks about, you know, his story starts all the way back in the uh, 1700s when um, the Germans went to settle, uh, I guess um, pacifist Germans went to settle um, in the southern plains of Russia and they were farmers and they developed this winter wheat that was ideally suited to that location. While well, you fast forward all of this political turmoil in that part of the world, and there were all these people that were immigrating to the United States in the late 1800s and early part of the 1900s. And um, they came, as we heard from uh, several people, with the seeds of this wheat sewn into the garments that they were wearing as a way to be able to carry the seed to this new place wherever they were gonna uh, settle. And so a lot of them ended up in this uh, part of the country and they had this wheat that just really um, thrived in this uh, dry climate. So that was one of the, the reasons that this area ended up being um, that helped this storm to build. So some of the other things that um, also happened were as this wheat became more successful and wheat prices started going up because of the war, and that would be World War I, more and more land was plowed up to plant wheat. And so people that didn't even have any farming experience uh, came to this uh, part of the world and decided that, that here was an opportunity for them to um, make a lot of money and so these suitcase farmers came in and they planted wheat, you know, they plowed up the land, sometimes they came back and planted, sometimes they got discouraged before um, they ever uh, planted any seeds, but there were an awful lot of ground uh, was plowed up. This is also the time that uh, the mechanization of farming started to really rapidly increase. And so, you know, there was a huge difference between what you could plow up with a plow and a team of ox or a couple of horses and what you could um, do with mechanized farming equipment. And so a lot more land was plowed up than, um, than also that should have happened. And then the, the rain started to, wheat prices started to fall, so people planted more wheat to realize the same amount of profit that they previously had. And then the rain started to fall off. So there were all these things that started to happen and in, in the late 20s it had become really dry. And then when the, um, the stock market crash of 1929 happened um, and all of those, uh, economic engines that had been at least making a little bit of a go of what was happening here uh, shut down. Um, it, it just got worse and worse. So Timothy Egan, he does a really good job of describing uh, what this was like. He said, at his peak, the Dust Bowl covered 100 million acres. Duster swept over the northern prairie as well. But the epicenter was the Southern Plains, an area the size of Pennsylvania was in ruin and on the run. I love his, uh, all of the turn of phrase that he has in his book. He said, more than a quarter million people fled the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Looking around now, it may seem that most people just hurried through the Southern Plains or left in horror. Not true, John Steinbeck told part of the story about getting out, moving somewhere green. 
Those were the exodusters. But Steinbeck's exiles were from eastern Oklahoma near Arkansas, mostly tenant farmers ruined by the collapse of the economy. The families in the heart of the black lizards were further west in towns like Guymon and Boyce City in Oklahoma, or Dalhart and Follette in Texas, or Rolla and Kismet in Kansas. Not much was heard about the people who stayed behind for lack of money or lack of sense. The people who hungered, hungered down and out of loyalty or stubbornness, who believed in tomorrow because it was all they had in the bank. Yet most people living in the center of the Dust Bowl, about two thirds of the population in 1930, never left during that hard decade. So now that I've given you um, a little bit of context, I wanted to uh, start playing some of the excerpts and, and some of the, the themes. So we've already talked about land that hadn't just failed the people living here, but it had actually, um, as many felt, turned against them. And so um, I will tell you, prior to playing any of these audio clips, we tested them a little bit earlier this afternoon, but the, the, the volume and the sound quality fluctuates a little bit, so I'm hoping that these are all understandable. And if it blasts you out, if you would raise your hand, or if you likewise, if you can't hear it. Um, my daddy and I went out in September of 34, right after I graduated from high school, and my brother and his wife had a baby. So we went out, and finally I said to daddy, and we drove mile after mile looked like it just been burned. And I said, well, why did they burn off all this land? They said that that sunburn, it, it just looked like all the pasture land out near there had, had been burned. And, uh, you know, there just wasn't anything Okay, so the interviewee actually set this up for, uh, for you, but in case you didn't get all of those details, um, and I didn't tell you who this was, this was um, Florence Nelson Wall, who actually uh, lived in Perkins, and she was one of the people that we uh, interviewed during our pilot phase of the project, but her family had property out in the Guyman area, but they lived back here, and her father would go and check on what would, he had some tenants out there and so he would go and check. And so in 1934, she was just 18 and she drove out there with them and she was talking about her surprise and how different um, everything looks that she said, you know, she actually thought that the land had um, been burned off and, you know, it was just the destruction that had happened because of the, the drought. So like many, um, you know, many people today in this room uh, could tell you um, if someone said, where were you when, you know, what were you doing or what were you thinking? Where were you when John F. Kennedy was shot or um, at the, you know, at the Oklahoma City bombing or any, or the 9-11, you know, any events like that for people that lived through this period. Black Sunday, everybody that we interviewed had some story that they wanted to share with us about their Black Sunday um, experience. And so um, the 75th anniversary of Black Sunday was, uh, I don't know if celebrated is the right word, but commemorated uh, out in Western Oklahoma in 2010. This event took place on April 14, 1935. It was uh, also Easter Sunday. And so a lot of um, people remember uh, specifically what they were doing and what their reaction was. So I wanted to share um, one of the one or two of these stories with you. Um, this is Carol Robertson of Shattuck. The most frightening to me was shortly after we were very Black Sunday, you may have heard of that Black Sunday. We 
we were pretty much, we would always be in the National Church regularly. Right mm -hmm. And the Sunday afternoon, we decided we'd go down to High Walks. We had a little pond back on the spring, and we'd fish up there. There's a lot of persimmon trees and a lot of other pretty things, so we went out there. We left right after lunch or took lunch with us, I don't remember. But it was probably 12 miles down there. I don't know where we went from. Probably up to the river. It must have been something like that. Yeah. And we had gone, uh, parked the car and gone up to the pond. Romy went to get a drink. And when he came back, he said, we got to go. So there was a big cloud coming up from the north. Well, by the time we got our fishing tackle back up to the car, that had hit him. He stood right, I was sitting down in the driver's seat, and he stood right beside me in the car, and I couldn't see him. Now, that was, that was the most drastic thing that I think I had ever endured. And we were very, oh yes, I did, yes, it's very and, and you know, if you knew anything about the scripture, you know what it says, you know, between the ark and this, that, and the so we just had the feeling like we have today that this is the end of time, you know. And it was very drastic and we sat, we had to sit there. Of course we knew the way in and out, but it was pretty rugged getting up to where that was. And uh, I guess there wasn't anybody home because we didn't even stop at the house. We just tried to get out of there and get on the road home. But all the way home it was just creeping along because after that lifted, well, you could at least begin to see where, where you had been and where, mm -hmm. where you were going, but it was very frightening to the whole community. But the dust storms were, they were perpetual, and you can depend on it. Every morning I'd dig out, and I mean dig out. Our little house was not a very sturdy house, but at least we had a home. Right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but it, we had windows and we had doors and it was all housed in. But the dirt came right through. I mean, it did every day and night. In the morning, before noon, it would clear out and you clean it out. But by the time you came, you were soaking your sheets and water to hang up in front of the windows and doors. It would come right through the sides of the house. And you know, people say, well, yeah, but if, if you had a brick house, it wouldn't, but it did, the homeless would build a new brick they house. Yeah. And, and their, right. their attics would get full of it. And if there was any seam around your door or anything, well, it would pile mm -hmm. inside. And that, of course, was what was making the, those, dump, those places down in the Stand Hill country, blow, the blowouts. Yeah. Right? because it would blow out till you would hit hard to <laughs> and then, But also then, everything that they raised out west came in. All of the thistles and weeds and everything like that came in and planted in their yards. Now we had a windmill and we just let it run and they watered their garden. But we got the darn dispatch of stuff going in it. Okay, so she talked about more than just uh, some Black Sunday, but some of these things that she talked about will be themes that um, are covered a little bit more later on. There, um, I think for in the interest of time, I'm not going to play this other excerpt, but one of the things that was interesting about this ex excerpt is that um, Willa, or El Elma Shanels is the person that was speaking. She lived um, out in Shattuck, and she said that they had just um, had a whole bunch of um, baby chicks and um, some hens, and that they were outside during the, when, you know, this big giant duster that was called Black Sunday uh, came along and that afterwards when they went out they thought all of their chickens were dead and her mother picked one of them up and turned it over and thumped it on the back and all of this you know dust came out and then it started running around in the yard again so they thought that they had lost all of their chickens but they were just like 
I don't know, momentarily uh, dazed or attempting, I don't know, partially asphyxiated. And so um, other people, you know, I thought, oh, that was a humorous story. But then we uh, heard that kind of thing a number of times. Um, this is a, it was a cute story um, where people who were talking about just the challenges of trying to keep your house clean when there was dust blowing in everywhere as uh, the previous uh, participant described, you know, the dust blowing up from the, the floorboards, through the ceiling, through the walls of the house. Rotting. <laughs> <laughs> And the sand drifted in the outhouse too. <laughs> oh, me! <laughs> yeah, and you had to sit down and you got sandy. <laughs> it was everywhere. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Well, how did you cope with just that being everywhere? Oh, uh, you know, you try to, there was no electricity and we didn't have any sweepers, you know, vacuums or anything. And you'd try to sweep it out with a broom. Well, you'd get a dustpan full, but in the meantime, it all, you know, in sweeping, it'd all go back up again and then settle on the furniture and the floor, and everything was gritty. We had cisterns, but they went dry. <laughs> yeah. And so then we had to have uh, well water, and it was real hard, and it would cause, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what you call it, but there'd be rims of the jigs around it. Uh -huh. The men went to Everything. the barn, the women went to the chicken house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I don't know if you heard that at the end, but the men went to the barn and the women went to the chicken house to use the, the bathroom because they, what they had had just uh, kind of dried up. So one of the people that I had a chance to interview was somebody that lived in Stillwater for uh, a long time. It seems like every, uh, every group of people that I spoke to, there was somebody in the group that knew Mary Lighty. And uh, she had her first uh, professional teaching position at Oklahoma Panhandle A&M College in Goodwill. And so she got there in uh, about 1936 and so uh, this is she's talking about how she would know if it was a good day or a bad day in terms of the dust and she also talks about Ed Morrison who was the president of that uh, college and some of the um, things a few things that he had done there teaching in home economics at that point. And um, if I got into the classroom, which is on the ground floor, there was a drop light over the desk, and that was all the light that was in the room. And if I could see the students out there, just in that room, well, that was a bad day, or a good day. A good day. Uh, so it's Ed, Mor Ed Morrison did as he took over, seal up all the windows so you could not, if, if there had been a fire, we just had to knock out and get out. Mm -hmm. But um, that helped tremendously as far as dust. But even then, that dust was just everywhere. everywhere. Hard to imagine teaching in a classroom where it could have been so dusty that you couldn't have seen the students who were uh, sitting in the back of the room. It's just kind of hard to imagine something like that. So um, 
in Carol Robertson's uh, story at the beginning, as she talked about uh, some of the blowouts that they had afterwards. And um, so Florence Nelson Wall talks a little bit about one of the a blowout that happened in their house. And you'll understand, if you don't know what a blowout is, you'll understand after you hear this. But this, um, she refers to the birth of her daughter, which um, happened in 1944. So this is after, you know, it was considered that the Dust Bowl was over, and yet there were all of these, um, you know, long-term impacts of that. Never did that again. I didn't do that again. I just was cold. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what you talk about the dust in my house. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Judith was born in April, I mean, in August after we had moved out there in the fall. And she was, it was the next spring, I guess. She was several months old. And one afternoon, um, I had uh, wanted Richard to take his nap. I put, and he wanted me to put Jesus on the bed with him. So, so I did. Well, he wouldn't play still. He just rolled one in the other and all. And he wasn't going to sleep, so I had gone in and picked Judith up off the bed. And I had not much more than gotten back in the living room when the ceiling fell, plaster ceiling, mm -hmm. right on the blanket where she had been lying. And it was just the dirt was the ceiling or the, the attic was just full of dirt from the and the walls between the outer side wall and the inside wall too were just from the years of dust storms. We had one good pretty good dust storm that first spring we were there. It's the only dust storm we had in the six years that I, we lived there. I was trying to iron that afternoon. I just was having a terrible time keeping the dust off of their things as I ironed. And the neighbors came up and said, well, you know, what do you think of this? And I thought, well, you know, I knew when we moved out here that they had dust storms, so I just as well get used to it. But that was the only one we had. Yeah. Forty-four people were killed, or, or, or they were still still blowing around that mm -hmm. So we heard lots of stories from people who talked about doing um, renovation projects to their homes in later years and um, having, you know, like knocking out a wall and discovering that there was the wall was just entirely packed. Uh, with this really fine dirt that had blown in there during those Dust Bowl uh, years. There are also lots of stories of, you know, places that um, they imploded under the weight of the, the dust, the, not just like a, a portion of a ceiling dropping down in a place where you had just had your baby in a few minutes before, but, you know, the whole the whole roof just uh, caved in into the inside of the house. So um, I, I guess there are still some places that were uh, constructed before the Dust Bowl days that um, are standing, but I think a lot of people that uh, have those homes in their family are a little bit uh, leery of them because you know they're not sure if they haven't mitigated the, the dust that there is some danger of uh, being in them. So um, another thing that we heard about were just because the dust uh, 
blew into such enormous drifts, sometimes shutting down uh, the roads so that they were impassable, but that people frequently um, didn't know where their property ended and someone else's began. And so um, one of our uh, interviewers, or one of our interviewees told us about um, her brother's experience. And she said, we used to go fishing up at Two Buttes. This is after, uh, the, she said this was after that. This doesn't quite make sense. Um, we used to go fishing up at Two Buttes and the dirt was over the fences, you know, well out here, um, out of, I guess about eight miles west. My brother had a field and the dirt was piled up in the fence rows and he dug that fence row out and there were about three or four fences, one on the top of the other out there under that dirt. Um, and it was just, you know, people would try to refence their land after one of these big dusters blew in and they sort of knew uh, where the, the fences went, but uh, not really. And that's just sort of mind boggling to think about that much blowing dirt. Uh, another thing that we heard quite a bit about uh, were rabbit drives, and in spite of a lot of people having stories about rabbit drives, um, it was interesting that when we were looking for photographs that there weren't um, really any photographs of rabbit drives in Oklahoma. This shows you an example of what one looked like, but this uh, picture is from California. And I'll just play this excerpt, someone telling their story. One of the things, another one of the things that we haven't mentioned that affected me terribly were rabbit rides. Oh, Do you yes. remember the rabbit ride? I had heard it once. They had to build a corner, and then everybody would get back here, women, men, and children, and run these jackrabbits in this corner and then pull them to death. Well, they, of course, they were eating the grass, and the grass. they were they were yeah. alive. They really were. But for well, cruelty, some chicken oh, might be out of several of them up on the river. You were you uh, heard of the rabbits down? Yeah. yeah. What you did is you would uh, take a section of land or a uh, mountain land, and they put up some uh, fencing or uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, yeah. Huh? You know that stuff about that wide? Uh, a barbed wire. No. Just more like a chicken wire? Four of the birds. What kind of material would it say? Huh? What kind of material was it? Oh, it'd be high. You know, it'd be well, high. Well, it was kind of, yeah, uh -huh. it had, it had fish, water in it. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Family? I know what you mean. It's, it's, we call it now snow fence. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's uh -huh. right. And, and uh, they just put posts down and put that up, and then everybody get way back, maybe a mile. Miles. And, 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 and run them in and drive them up there. Up and then they pull, pull in that fence. But I never did with the killing. I would just throw them in because I was mad at them. You can do that either on Sunday afternoon, so oftentimes we'd go uh, hunting. And that was I know I learned to shoot, and I and uh, I was just as good a shot as my brother was. And uh, some of the neighbors, Gordon, and uh, the Whitmans. Of course, the Whitmans lived only a mile and a half off. The first time I ever shot a rabbit, <laughs> we were, I went on a date. He said, "Let's go, let's go rabbit hunting." I said, "All right." He said, "Well, you shoot one." I said, "Oh, sure, I'll shoot a rabbit." Well, I didn't know anything about the gun. I didn't know anything about anything. He said, "Tell him there's one over there." And I shot the darn thing, and then it jumped like that, and they just flapped over, and I was just sick to my stomach. <laughs> but it was doing the best. But they did uh, take some of them, people did, that had families. They took them and drank Yes, but they were scared of them. And, and, but that was a little later on that they decided they might have some kind of disease. Um, and they quit doing that. Mm -hmm. But th that did help people out at one time huh? mm -hmm. the first, when they first started. But I think one thing we learned from that was to get along. 
I mean, we did what we, was what we had. And we were happy at it. We didn't know any different, I guess. I didn't, I didn't think I was underprivileged or anything. They had clothes even though they were made out of beef sacks and, and well, flour and sacks. Of course, we were fortunate. We didn't have any trouble with food. You know, some people were hungry. But no, we didn't. Okay, so I played that long excerpt because I wanted you to hear um, a couple of things. One is just the, all the different experiences that came out when one person started talking about uh, these jackrabbit drives. But another thing is that it may, logistically, it was really challenging conducting these interviews, sometimes with as many as uh, five or six women participating because we knew we were going to create a transcript. So somebody had to be the interviewer, and the really, that wasn't the hard job, that was a really fun job. The hard job was sitting there and taking notes about who was speaking and what they started to say, because as soon as you got that down, then the next person was speaking, so that we had some hope when we came back to create the transcript of being able to match, you know, the right, uh, the right name with the right uh, person speaking. So uh, another thing that we heard uh, stories about frequently were the cattle killings that took place because people could no longer feed their cattle and the government was really concerned that this would be the cause of disease and yet another problem that people uh, in these really hard uh, hit areas of drought would have to contend with and frequently women told us that in you know about a particular experience with their um, father ha being forced to have his cattle killed and that out of all of the really hard things that the family had gone through during this time that it was the only thing that they had seen that had made their dads cry and uh, after hearing lots of stories about this in a different project that we were working on with the Kenton uh, Museum, they had a photograph on the wall of a flatbed truck that was loaded um, up with cattle that had been killed in one of these um, forced cattle killings. So I'm going to play this excerpt for you. Why do you think that uh, you and your family stayed? <laughs> Depression is on to me. That's another thing. You have to stay here and make the best of it. It's our home. It's a farmer for quite self-contained. I mean, they were, they had cows for milk, they had chickens for eggs, and they had their cream and, and, uh, so, so they pretty well uh, were able to, if they had cows and things like that. But the thing is, when they had too many cattle, they didn't have no feed, no feed. The only one who came and killed them. Yep, they didn't work with the cows. They didn't work with the cows. They didn't work with the cows. What was the Shattuck community reaction to that? What was the reaction to that here, of killing the cow? Well, there's nothing they could do. Nothing they could do. They were throwing feet to feed them, and the cows would starve. Of course, we didn't have very many. We could start out farming, and uh, uh, we didn't have any of ours uh, killed. And uh, we just had a milk or two or three milk cows, and we had a few horses. We still farmed with these horses at the time. And uh, so, we uh, we just did what we could to get by. Yeah, big cows was our baby. Yeah, yeah, because chickens, eggs was, and we had two. Okay, we did. <laughs> we had two children. The one was five, and the other was one year old. And. Uh, it's hard to keep the diet before so I <laughs> Tell me about doing laundry. Just that not even, not necessarily because it's during the dust bowl, just in general, you know, if you have electricity, you don't have electricity, how are you doing laundry? What is the process of that? We didn't, uh, we didn't have to 
nine or seven could buy, we just had to make them ourselves out of material, and we had to work them and, and use them and work them again. And, yeah, well, at that time, I already had a uh, washing machine with a gas motor. But uh, anyway, uh, we were shining, and then we had to make sure you washed them and clean it up. And the next day, the star came in again. It was just changing the oil and all that to work. You could clean out one day, but it was not the next day if you wanted it. We had a Okay, so I'm sorry that was so long, but I also wanted you to hear the story about what it was like to uh, do laundry. So if you ever, you know, on a Saturday morning, wake up and feel frustrated that you have multiple loads of laundry to throw into your nice automatic washing machine, followed by your nice, you know, automatic dryer, well, um, you can think about these women and what a challenge it was to, to keep things clean. So um, we also heard stories about how difficult it was to uh, travel on the roads because of limited visibility and that um, people uh, ran their light, their running lights all the time. I mean, today that's really common because our cars automatically do that for us, but then it was something that it was just a real a safety necessity so that people could see each other. Um, and that wasn't the only hazard to travel. You know, you might be able to see what was coming down the road in the other direction, but you also might just get stuck in a, in a drift. And some people obviously never, uh, they got really permanently uh, stuck in, in drifts with the, um, their automobiles and farm equipment. One of the things that was interesting um, as we moved westward with this project is one of the first in one of the pilot interviews we did in Woodward, um, you know, the person said, well, it was really hard here, but those people in Gaiman, they really suffered. And then when we w went to Gaiman, they said, oh, it was, you know, things were bad in Gaiman, but boy, in Boyce City, you know, that's where things were rough. And then in Boyce City, you know, the people were telling us, oh, it was bad here, but those people in Dalhart or, you know, some other place, uh, not where they were, that it was even worse. And um, I am not a psychologist, but it, it was really interesting to me that as sort of a mental survival strategy that you had to have this idea that if you were stuck someplace, then you weren't at the worst place. Uh, that there was, and we just found that to be interesting that it seemed like it happened in um, more interviews than it didn't happen. Um, people also talked about how this experience made them extremely thrifty, and um, even some extreme cases of thriftiness that we heard about. Um, I thought that this quote that came out of one of the interviews, um, Florence, again, Florence Nelson Wall, she said that her husband had told her this, well, I can promise you this, we'll never miss a meal, but we may postpone a few. And, um, you know, there were lots of stories uh, about people being hungry uh, during that time. And I realize that we're getting on to an hour here, but I think the thing that um, really struck us from conducting these interviews beyond just the, um, you know, some of the amazing stories that we heard was just this uh, attitude of um, real resilience and not seeing the experience that they had as uh, anything amazing or anything that made them uh, noteworthy in any way. It was just you know, this is, this is what happened to us, this is what we did, and we um, have just continued to do that our whole lives. And so, uh, I just have this incredible respect for the people that lived through that uh, time and the hardships that they, that they dealt with. And um, I would just encourage you that if you um, haven't gone to the website where a lot of these project interviews are, 
that you, um, if you are curious, that you would take the opportunity to go and to listen uh, to some of these stories. And um, I, I think that, um, that the interviews, and many of the interviews that I think are the most interesting are not ones that I conducted. So I will, will say that so that I'm not, uh, you know, sounding like I'm bragging on myself, but um, the, they're just some fascinating uh, stories uh, that we uncovered in this project. And then I hope that if you want to learn more about this period, that um, in addition to anything that you might read about this period, that you would also take the uh, opportunity to listen to these firsthand accounts. And so, um, anyway, if anyone has any questions, I would be glad to uh, answer those either now or afterwards individually. Any when questions? People yes. People died, um, and the dust was so deep. Did, you, did anybody ever say, like, if they went and parted the dust and got to the hard ground and put them in? And I would think there would not be any tombstones or markers. Or, but I've never been in that area. Right. Um, Actually, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that we heard but we could never verify is that, um, so there was a lot of dust pneumonia at that time that was just caused by, you know, breathing in all of that blowing dust. And um, several people told us um, in the Beaver area that there was a baby cemetery that was just full of babies that had had dust pneumonia and had been buried and they said, oh, it's just over the border in Texas. And so, you know, we went driving around on some section line roads and talked to some people, but we could never, you know, verify the actual location. Um, but one of the um, people that's featured in Timothy Egan's book, um, Hazel Shaw, she also wrote a book called Sunshine and Shadows that some libraries in Oklahoma have. and. Um, she was in the, um, she was a mortician, she and her husband. And so they talk a little bit about funerals, that they had funerals, but I don't, you know, I have no idea what the logistics would have been of trying to bury someone. It's a good question. Yes? The lady that you talked about that was 97, I just can't imagine how she could have lived through all that and what she did with so many people dying and so on, all the dust. It's just amazing to me. And then also, how hard it would be to reach, it's hard to raise a baby anyway, let alone at that time, it just... Oh. It was definitely an extra challenge, but like I said, you know, people just, you know, they told us, they told us our story, or they told us their stories because we asked the questions, but, they didn't tell us their stories because they thought that there was anything like really notable or amazing about that. So, yeah, and there, there are s stories in there that we, uh, I didn't have time to cover today, but you know, talk about the particular challenges of child rearing and just you know the one we heard about doing diapers, you know, a really basic thing for caring for a baby and how much of their time that that took up. Any other questions, comments? Yes, I was really struck by the, uh, the fact that people always had to force a little further down the road. Uh, the language of folklore studies, this is just the most common thing that happens to you when you interview. If you want to collect uh, some stories for people, they say, well, we got some good stories around here. But if you'll just go further up the ridge here, they, they've got much better stories than we do. And of course, for us linguists, when we want to find out how people talk, we say, well, we talk pretty funny around here. But if you just go down the river here a little bit, you'll hear some really funny talk to people. So it's interesting that in this sort of tragic situation, the same kind of process seems to work. If you just go a little further on, you know, it's worse or it's very different from the ones around here. I don't know what kind of human condition it is, but it's very, very common. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm sure there must psychologists must have a name for that, but I just haven't figured out uh, what yeah what it is. Anything else? Did any of them mention churches? I mean, could the churches even function? 
Um, so the church, yeah, the churches did um, function, and some of them mentioned churches, although it wasn't specifically something that we were um, interested in per se. A lot of them talked about, you know, the the, the church serving as a community gathering um, place, and some of them even talked about, you know, revivals or preaching that you know, this was the end of times or that kind of thing, which some people thought when the, you know, when Black Sunday happened. Um, but we didn't get a lot of information about churches. One of the interesting things that we did discover is that there were um, people out in the panhandle during this time that were identified as gypsies, um, which wasn't something that we, you know, went looking for when we did the interviews, but we just kept hearing stories of, you know, well, this gypsy gypsy family, and we would, you know, try to clarify. Now, do you mean like hobos? And no, they, this was something different. So, I, you know, there were just enough of those stories that made me think. Well, there there must have been some group of people that were nomadic out there. Okay. Any any other questions? Well, thank you so much for um, attending, and again, I hope that you'll take a look at the project site online. Thank you.